Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the April. I cannot believe that I'm saying April uh, financial check in with fame and happy financial literacy month. We're super excited that you're all here. Um, obviously, those of you that are with us either have internet or power, one or the other. So we very much appreciate it. Uh, as I said earlier, if you just joined though, we will be recording this webinar. So if you have any colleagues or anyone that you would like to share the recording with or anyone that couldn't join today because they don't have power or, or internet, uh, we are going to make it available on the FAME website and we will send the link to all registrants uh, after the fact. So no worries if you didn't get a chance or, or, or were not able to join, but you didn't register. But of course, you're not here to hear that. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Mary Dyer and I'm financial education programs manager at the Finance Authority of Maine. Also with me from fame, his camera's not on right now and doesn't necessarily need to be, but I just want to call out Steve Coutts. He is our financial education program specialist and doing amazing work in supporting fame statewide financial education efforts. So we're super happy to have him. And I want to put a plug in. He launched a new blog this month on our website, a financial wellness blog. So if you haven't been to the finance, financial wellness section of the FAME website lately, I encourage you to check it out because there's a lot of new resources that we've launched in recognition of April as Financial Literacy Month. So financial check-ins, this is a monthly webinar series that we offer on the first Friday of every month at noon. Again, we record it. So the previous sessions that we've hosted are available on our uh, YouTube channel. So feel free to check it out. And this is part of an ongoing series. So I hope you'll again, spread the word far and wide and join us uh, when possible. So I am super, super, super thrilled to uh, welcome and introduce my favorite financial wellness speaker in the whole on the whole planet. If anybody says to me, you know, who would you like to hear talk about finances? It's hands down Sarah Newcomb. Um, so I am so thrilled to welcome her. Sarah is in Vermont these days, but she hails from Maine and received her PhD in behavioral economics. And that might not be the exact uh, degree. Is, did I get that right, Sarah? Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Uh, right here at the University of Maine, and then has taken all of that knowledge and her experience experience across the country and across the globe and has become a phenomenal keynote speaker. Uh, one thing I want to call out because I haven't had a chance to congratulate her myself mm -hmm. is she was recently honored um, with, by Nas the National Jumpstart Coalition for Personal Financial Literacy with the William Odom Visionary Leadership Award and she'll be headed to DC in April in just a couple of weeks to accept that honor. So we are Super thrilled. She's an author, speaker, uh, just break. It's able to take really complex information and break it down in a way that even I can understand. So we're so thrilled to have you, Sarah. Uh, she uh, uh, runs the Thrive Financial Empowerment Center. Uh, so we are so thrilled to have her. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah. Welcome. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. And Mary was one of the first uh, enthusiastic supporters of my work. And so I could not be where I am if it weren't for Mary. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, I do have one quick question for you, Mary, before I dive in, which is with the webinar format, should I be leaving time for questions or not? Yeah, so great. I should have mentioned that. So thank you. So what folks can do who joined, if you have questions during Sarah's presentation, feel free to put the questions in the Q&A. And then Sarah, as you kind of transition through, um, you can ask me if there's any questions. I'll monitor that. And then we will leave some time at the end uh, to answer any questions that you all might have. I've got a couple of things I want to show you uh, that are available through FAME, just a couple quick things to make you aware of, uh, but we do want to leave time for questions and conversation, so feel free to, um, you know, put those in the, the Q&A and we'll monitor that for you, Sarah. Okay, great, All right. great. Well, so thank you to everyone um, who is here. I can't see you, but uh, hopefully you can feel me through uh, the interwebs. Um, I love this topic. Um, talking about how do you build financial freedom when you're starting from scratch. Um, I think it's so important because so often financial education starts with when you get some money, here's what to do with it. 
And I know I personally needed a lot of help to figure out how to get some money in the first place. Um, it's not as easy as, um, as it may seem. I spent a long time before uh, I went to college, um, I spent a long time working at, um, in, in just, you know, jobs that I could get. And um, there weren't that many of them. <laughs> so it took a while for me to find my feet. And I try to create resources for people that are the type of thing that I wish I had when I was um, when I was first starting to understand personal finance. So I'm going to bring you through a whirlwind of information in the next 42 minutes, um, leaving time for questions at the end. Um, in three parts, we're going to talk about how do you build financial freedom when you're starting from scratch. Um, again, there's going to be a lot of information here. Um, thankfully, it's recorded, so you can always go back and watch it again if you like. Um, but also, I would encourage you if there are slides that you like to screenshot them, there's a couple of graphs that you might want uh, to hang on to. So diving in. What is financial freedom? Let's start with some definitions here. A lot of people will tell you different things. One of the definitions I like comes from T. Harv Ecker. I don't know who this is, but I like what he said. My definition of financial freedom is simple. It is the ability to live the lifestyle you desire without having to work or rely on anyone else for money. So that's the end goal here is that you are master of your time. Work is optional. That's what we what I mean when I say financial freedom. Okay, so that's our end goal that we're working toward here. So part one, well, how do you do it? <laughs> now, obviously, everybody's path is going to be unique to them. But there is, I have found, a very simple strategy that you can stick to as your big picture strategy. And this holds, these principles I'm about to teach you, they hold whether it doesn't matter what industry you're in, what education you've had, where you live in the world, or what the economy is doing. This is how you go from zero to financial freedom using basic economic principles. So part one, we understand life costs money, right? So how much income do you need right? You need income because life costs money. How much income? Really, it's enough to cover your chosen cost of living. So you could have lifestyle A, where, you know, moderate amount of stuff might cost you 50000 a year. Lifestyle B, different stuff can cost you double or more. Plenty of people live $300,000 a year lifestyles. That requires a higher income. And so, where you choose for your chosen cost of living, that part is up to you. And we're going to talk to we're going to talk a little bit later about how we can live a life we love while keeping it small enough that we don't overwhelm our need for resources. Um, but we'll get to that in a bit. So life costs money. You need income to cover your chosen cost of living. So now we get into some economics. Okay, now income is produced by assets, all right? Assets are things that have value, that create income. And actually, according to economics, there's only three kinds of assets or resources. You've got land, that could be real estate, it could be forestry land, it could be a quarry, it could be um, a, a building. Land is one type of asset. You've got labor. We all are familiar with labor. And you've got capital. Capital is stuff, okay? So it could be physical capital, like a tractor or um, or a car, or it could be uh, financial capital, like money or stocks or bonds. But these are the only three types of capital we have, or types of assets, land, labor, and capital, okay? Now, some of us, some people are fortunate enough to start their lives with a portfolio of assets they have enough land and capital to their name or their family's name that they never need to labor for income. And that's very fortunate. Some people start off with that. Most of us, on the other hand, most of us start with the exact opposite portfolio of assets. We don't have any land or any capital to our name. And the only way that we have, the only asset that we have to produce income is labor. So if that's 
where you're starting from, that's where we need to start our financial journey, right? So if you're starting from zero, like most of us do, then how do you get to financial freedom? Well, here's the process. You start with your labor. Now, if you're in this situation, then the first investment that you should make is not in stocks or bonds. The first investment that you should make is not even in real estate. It is in making your labor as valuable as possible in the marketplace. Invest in the value of your labor. And the reason for this is simple. There's a thing we call wage slavery. And a lot of people around the world are stuck in wage slavery. And if you've ever lived paycheck to paycheck, like I have, you know that it really is a form of slavery because you can't get out of it. Uh, wage slavery is basically where you're earning just enough to get by and sometimes just a little less than it takes to get by, which then gets you in a debt trap. And you can't save because there's no extra. And if you're in a situation like that, you just, you absolutely can't get ahead. There is no way to build financial freedom when you have no extra in your earnings. So you have to find a way to increase the value of your labor. And that doesn't necessarily mean uh, university. It doesn't necessarily mean college. That is a path that many people take, but what you need is not sco uh, school. What you need is skills. You have unskilled labor is worth a certain amount of money in the marketplace. And basically unskilled labor is worth as little as people can legally pay you and sometimes less. Skilled labor is worth more. And it depends on how rare the skills are, how difficult they are to come by, how many people around you have those skills and whether or not they're really valuable in, uh, in the current marketplace. So even when you have skilled labor, you need to constantly be investing in upskilling so that your skills don't become uh, you know, less valuable in the marketplace. But you don't necessarily need university, you need skills. And so what you wanna do is you wanna take what you love to do, what you are good at or what you could be good at and what people will pay you to do. That's the trifecta, right? You like it, you're good at it or you can learn to be good at it and people need it and will pay you for it. You get those three things. And then what you do is you add, this is part of liking it, you add your special sauce, that thing that makes it you. And that's what really makes you stand out in the marketplace is valuable. So that's what you should be investing in first if you're starting from zero. What is that thing that you can create from your time, energy, and intelligence that the world around you needs and values? And when you do that, now you have made your, value, your, your labor valuable as possible in the marketplace. Now you're going to have more coming in. You're, you can avoid wage slavery through investing in the value of your labor. So that's step one. To avoid wage slavery, invest in the value of your labor. Now, if you ever want to stop laboring, then you have to find a way to take some of the income coming in from your labor, that's covering your cost of living, right? Your labor, the money comes in from your labor, it goes to pay for your cost of living. Now, by making your labor valuable, hopefully, you and by keeping your cost of living in in reasonable shape then what you really want is that some of the money from your labor you have to find a way to put some of it toward land and capital land and or capital these other assets that don't require you to labor but they also earn money so as you take a portion of your labor income and we'll talk about what portion that really needs to be in the future uh, in a couple slides. You take some of the labor from your income or some of the income from your labor, you put it into land and capital investments. And then those investments start earning income. And as they earn income, you can either have them, it, what you do is you have them um, 
or you reinvest that income until such a point that the income from your land and capital investments is enough to cover your cost of labor with uh, or your cost of living without labor. So let me replay this for you. All right. You start off. This is this right here is a picture of living paycheck to paycheck. Everything from your labor covers your cost of living. There's no extra. You can't get free. You will be laboring all your life. Now, if you can find a way to spend less than you earn, and generally when you're starting from scratch, that means earn more than you are starting out as, make your labor more valuable, then you have to put some of that toward land and capital. The income generated by your land and capital, you reinvest until the value of your land and capital is large enough that the income from your land and capital alone can replace the income from your labor. And that now, this is the picture that we were jealous of a few minutes ago when we said, well, some people have enough land and capital that they never need to labor. Well, this is what financial freedom looks like. You have enough, what some people call passive income. It's not really passive because you need to manage these investments. If you have land, you need to keep the value of it good. If you have capital, you need to watch your investments. But when you're income from your land and capital investments is large enough to cover your cost of living. Now you have reached what, what I like to call work optionality. You can work if you want to, but it's not required of you in order to maintain your cost of living. And this is the picture of financial freedom. So it's a very simple strategy. That doesn't mean it's easy. Simple, yes. Easy, no. So before we move on to part two, I want to give a moment and ask if there are questions on that first big picture strategy of um, how you get from zero to financial freedom. No questions in the in the Q&A or in the chat, Sarah. Okay. Great. My guess is people might be saying, okay, I can't afford land now or even if I save for 10 years. Yep. What are some examples of those interim approaches, whether it's land or capital? Because right. are you going to get into that later? <laughs> no, that's great. That's that's a really good point. So so land, yeah, we think about real estate, right, for land. Um, it could be real estate. It could be, um, there are other ways that, there are ways that you can actually invest in sort of a combination of capital and land. Things called real estate investment trusts are um, their investments that you can buy that they actually like group a whole bunch of people's money together and buy real estate. And then you get, um, you earn interest if it if the value of those properties grow. It's one type of capital investment you can make. But generally, if, if you were to take um, any of your, your earnings and put it into um, simple investments like, bonds, mutual funds, even money market funds. So like right now there are money market funds, which are basically like savings accounts with just a little bit of risk. They might lose a tiny bit of money, but they rarely ever do. Um, but you can, things like things like bonds and, and money market uh, funds and, and even high yield savings accounts can get you things like about 5% interest right now. Um, and 5% interest is not nothing. Over time, 5% interest will, will double your money. In, um, it would take about, it takes a while, but compounding interest, when, you've, when you learn about that, you can see that like what starts off really slow eventually gets faster and faster and faster if you can keep contributing and keep invested. So a little bit does matter. Um, and I would say where you want to start is starting with an emergency fund and just having your emergency fund in an account that is earning interest. You are earning money on your money. Um, and as you build up security, you know, so first you go from not having any to having a little bit of savings. And then the stability that you build over time also compounds and you'll find that it becomes easier and easier to save. In the beginning, it is very difficult. We, we're gonna talk about how, you, how to keep your lifestyle in check 
in part three. Um, the the basic outline of how you go from zero to land and capital investments is was part one. But now we're going to talk a little bit more of the mechanics, like how much do you actually need to save and what does that translate to how long it's going to take to reach financial freedom? So this Thank is you, Claire, That's great. That's I just want to encourage people comments in the Q&A, just, you know, even if it's a comment, and not really a question, um, you know, feel free to put in your thoughts or ideas or questions yeah. as we move along. So nothing there now, but go right ahead and I'll, I'll keep an I eye see on it. One thing in a oh, comment just yeah. showed up. And I do want to say too, if you are working at a place that has a retirement program, a 401k program, please, please, please take advantage of that. Because if they have any match to that, what that means is really you get free money. I mean, if I if I were to say to you, would you like an investment that will get you, you know, a hundred percent return on on your first, you know, deposit or two. And then after that it might grow, you know, at five or seven percent a year. Of course, people will be like, yeah, I, I want that. That I'm getting a hundred percent return on at least part of it. You know, that is basically what a 401k is. Your your company will literally pay you more money than they do now if you dedicate some of your money to savings. And so you can effectively give yourself a raise if you participate in a retirement, in a 401k plan. And you don't have to max it out, but doing anything, at least at least participating as much as you can. Honestly, even if it's only $25 a paycheck, it's something and you'll get that matched by your company. And then as you can do more, you do more. Um, saving is not the kind of thing that you want to wait until you can save a lot. Like if all you can save is $10 a week, then save $10 a week. And when you can do 15, then do 15. And when you can do 50, do 50. It is, it's like a muscle that you build. I started off as a total spender. Saving was so uncomfortable to me. Now I like challenge myself. How can I possibly save more? I love it, but I used to hate it. It really is. It's like running. You have to get the the taste for it. And you have to build your muscles up over time. So save a little bit and then save more over time. Um, I want to get to questions here if, if there are some. Yeah, there were a couple more. Um, I think you're going to address one of the okay. questions about emergency funds in your next section. The question was about how much should I have saved? So I think you're going to go there. Um, one was sort of a comment. So with the current uh, real estate market, high rates, low inventory, high prices, it's really expensive in today's yeah. environment to buy land or real estate. Would it make more sense to focus on capital? Yeah, I would right now. I'd focus on capital. And again, like focus on, focus on, you know, if you need, if you might need the cash in the next, you know, if you might need it for something, then put it in someplace that you can get at it really easily. There's not going to be any penalties, but you're still earning interest like a high yield savings account or a money market mutual fund. Um, and I'm sure fame has all sorts of um, great resources about like, what are the kinds of, of, uh, capital investments that you can make. I'm not getting into the specifics here, but um, point being, you know, get get the highest interest you can with the least risk possible until you get to a point where you can afford to take on more risk uh, without worrying about it. Um, and the next question was about the mechanism itself, which you've talked about. You know, someone had said, I've been, you know, putting money in a savings account for nearly a decade. It earns cents. It's not earning much over the years. What would you suggest? So you've already had some, you know, provided some suggestions, Sarah. I would add that if this, you know, if you have a relationship with a, a bank or a credit union, you know, start there, find mm -hmm. out what high yield options they have or, you know, options that are going to earn more than pennies of interest. Yeah. Um, so start there. I don't know if you have any other tips, Sarah. Yeah, I would say, I, I think when it comes to savings, rate shop, bank shop, your, your bank generally, credit unions tend to be better, but most banks don't have any loyalty to you. You don't need to have loyalty to them. If there's a place that will pay you more for you to keep your money with them, do it. Uh, so long as it's safe and FDIC insured. Um, all right. I want to, I want to make sure we get through, we've got two more sections and only 24 more minutes. So I want to, I want to make sure that we get through it. 
This next part, part two, how much, I'm going to warn you guys, this is the scary bit. I'm going to show you some numbers that are not easy to swallow. But the reason why I'm going to show you them is because they're real. And I don't think we do ourselves any favors by not paying attention to reality. So how much do you need to save to reach financial freedom? Well, when we say, how much will I need? Again, it depends on your lifestyle. It depends on your cost of living, right? But most of us are not living super large. We are just trying to get by. And with the cost of living going up, this becomes harder and harder. But how much will you need to completely leave work behind? Now, the numbers I'm going to show you are more scary than they necessarily have to be because I'm not including social security in this. All right. So this is the numbers I'm going to show you. Assume you are providing every penny for yourself when you retire. No, no social security or anything. Okay. So I'm going to show you um, some math that is kind of cool. Um, and, and this illustrates what a lot of people will call the 25x rule. Um, now, if we assume that money you invest earns about 7% annual interest, so if you had it invested in the stock market, that's a, a fairly reasonable assumption. If you have like index funds, not individual stocks, those are really risky, but index funds or exchange traded funds, 7% annual growth. And 3% inflation. Now, I know inflation has been a lot higher in the last couple of years, but oh, before that, it was like zero for three years. So on the average, inflation is about 3% a year, okay? So if we assume your money you invest earns 7% a year on average, and inflation is 3% per year on average, then this, I'm going to show you a graph that shows you how long your money would last you if you save 10 times your cost of living, 15 times your cost of living, 20 times your cost of living, and 25 times your, uh, your cost of living. So if you if your cost of living is 40,000 a year, 10 times would be $400,000, okay? Um, if your cost of living is 40,000 a year, 25 times your cost of living is $1 million, okay? So what we have on the bottom on the X axis here is the years from zero to 120 years. And on the Y axis, we have these savings multiples, but notice that 25 times is down at the bottom. So up at the top, we're gonna start with 10 times your cost of living. And basically if you save 10 times your cost of living and then you suddenly stop working, how long would those savings last you if you don't change anything about your lifestyle and you just start spending down your savings? It would last you about 13 years. If you have 15X, that'll last you about 23 years. If you have 20 times your cost of living, that'll last you about 41 years. And if you have 25 times your cost of living, that will effectively last you forever. You can keep drawing on on that money and it will grow uh, enough that you could draw on it forever and it will always bounce back. So depending on how long you plan for, so maybe you think you'll be in retirement for 10 years. Maybe you're planning on being in retirement for 15. Maybe you wanna be in retirement for 40 years. You know, if you think, well, I, I, think I want to retire at 50 and I think I'll, I'll live to 90, then you'd want to target 20 times your cost of living. So it's a, it's a lot. 20 times your cost of living is a lot. Again, this does not count for social security. So the reality is that most people will be very financially secure if they target like a 10, like a 15 times their cost of living because that 23 years of financial freedom plus social security will last most people as long as they will live in retirement. If they're retiring in their 60s and they also have social security, 15 times your cost of living is, there is a very healthy amount to save. 
Now, if what you're targeting is, I want to leave money to the next generation, I want to create multiple generational wealth, then yeah, you want to target 25 times your cost of living, at least. Um, so I would say, depending on your goals and depending on what's realistic for you, targeting a 15X is very, very um, strategic. Um, again, it's a simple concept. It's not easy to do because now we're going to talk about how long is it going to take you to save that much money? Well, it depends on your savings rate, right? If you're not, if you're saving 0%, it will take you forever to save anything. If you're saving 10% of your income, then it'll take you a certain amount of time. And I did the math to figure out how long at different savings rates will it take you to reach these in, these uh, cost of living multiples, okay? So this graph, I will walk you through. On the bottom of the x-axis, we have, again, the years of saving, how long you would have to save for, for these things. And on the y-axis, we have the income multiples. So starting from zero, going up to five times your cost of living, 10 times your cost of living, 15 times your cost of living. And the good thing about this graph is it doesn't matter what your cost of living is. This tells you at certain savings rates, how long it will take you to save up a particular multiple of your cost of living. So let's say you're targeting a 10 times your cost of living multiple, the 10 X multiple. So that dotted line going horizontally from 10, um, across, you can see that if you are saving only 10% of your income, that's this far green line over on the right. And so if you're only saving 10%, and I don't mean to make it sound like saving 10% is easy because it is not. Most people save less than four or 5%. But if you saved, even if you were saving 10%, it would take you about 10 about 40 years to reach a 10x multiple for your cost of living. And this is the scary truth. It takes a long time to reach a 10x multiple. It takes even longer to reach any larger multiple than that. But if you want to actually reach financial freedom where you never need to worry about working again, then, and if you want to say, and I don't plan for social security, which I think we can plan for social security, at least some of it. But if you're targeting a 10 X multiple and you're saving 10%, it will take you about 40 years to get to your goal. So that's fine. If you're starting at 20, if you're starting at 40, like I did, that is, I don't want to be working till I'm 80, you know? So I have to find a way to save more than 10%. Now, if you jump up to 20%, that's this yellow line here. And at 20%, it'll take about 27 years to reach that 10X multiple. Well, starting at 40, if I save 20, if I save 20% a year, then 67 is a pretty reasonable retirement age. So I could comfortably target 20% to reach total financial independence, even if I had no social security. Um, if I were aiming higher or if I wanted to get there faster, 30% will do the job in 21 years. 40, uh, 50%, which is unreasonable by most standards, you'll get there in 15 years. And if you can save 70% of your income, like some super savers focus on this, the, the financial independence retire early crowd, the fire crowd, they pride themselves on saving the majority of their income so that they can reach this multiple um, by, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, you could reach that 10X multiple in just about 11 years if you were saving 70% of your income. Now, obviously, that is unrealistic for most people. And just getting to the 10X multiple is hard enough. Um, but I really, uh, doing all this math and thinking through all of this has really convinced me that as 
as soon as possible in any way you can find it to do it to save 20% of your take home pay that if you save 20% of your income you'll be okay that's pretty much the rule of thumb that i've come to is find a way to save 20% and if that means you need to take you need to invest again in your um in your skills so that you can upsell your labor so that you can get a promotion so that you can increase your salary um do it because if if you save 20% everything will take care of itself but if you're if you're saving less than 20% then you're going to be really needing to watch your cost of living like a hawk and watch um and and just be you know you're, you're going to be saving for a long time um so that is the ugly reality. It will take a long time. Um, but the good news about this is that when you know this, when you know that this is the reality, then you can start to say, well, what is my goal? If you really want to build intergenerational wealth and you want to target that 25x multiple and you say, well, I can save 20, 20%. I will find a way to save 20%. Well, then in 45 years, I know it seems like an eternity, but the time will pass and you'll either have the money at the end of it or you won't. Um, the, if you if you save 20% for 45 years, you can achieve intergenerational wealth that will last uh, you and your loved ones for as long as, you know, as long as they reasonably um, manage it. So it is not impossible. It is a challenge, but this is what it takes, 10 to 20% hopefully 20. So before we move on to the last section, how in the world can I find 20% to put towards savings? I want to pause again for questions. Sarah, to back up. So before, um, you know, we talked about emergency savings. Um, one of the questions that came up after the fact was, how what much? do you recommend? So how yeah. much before we get into the additional yeah. you know, the graph that you just showed us, what do you, what's sort of the rule of thumb there? Yeah. So the rule of thumb with um, emergency savings, people will say three to six months, but that is arbitrary. This is the real rule. Think about how long, if you lost your job today, if you suddenly had no income today, how long would it realistically take you not to just find any new job, but to find a job that you actually really love? to find a job that you love and that would pay you well and your next great job, how long would that take? And that's how long, that's how much you wanna have in emergency savings. Because what that does for you is, let's say you, you think realistically, well, I'm in a management position, that might take me you know, four to six months to go through um, the interview processes and to, to really land a job that's good. Um, or if you think, honestly, it might take me a year, then the reality is that if you don't have that much in savings, then at some point in your job search, you're going to settle. You're going to settle for a job that you don't love or a job that just helps you get by and it doesn't pay you what you deserve, what your skills are worth, and you are, you will easily slip back into wage slavery. And so the point of an emergency fund is really to make sure that if a big shock came along and you didn't have income, that you wouldn't have to make major changes to your lifestyle uh, for as long as it takes you to find a great new position um, because you don't want to be settling. You want to be moving forward. And if you know, it, it's, it's an incredible sense of peace of mind when you can say to yourself, well, even if I lost my job today, I would have enough time to be able to find the next great job. I wouldn't need to be, I wouldn't be scrounging. I wouldn't be desperate. I wouldn't have to go work at a job that I hate just to, just to put food on the table. So the ideal emergency fund is have enough to cover your basic expenses for as long as you think it would take to find a great new job if you lost yours today. 
I think we're good. No other questions for now. Okay. Thank so you. in nine minutes, I'm going to try to talk to you about how, how do you arrange your life so that you can save 10 to 20% of your income? So we talked about wage slavery and how we need to stay away from wage slavery because you can never get ahead if you're only earning uh, enough to get by. Um, so you increase your your the value of your labor. Great, now you've avoided wage slavery. But there is another kind of wage slavery that we can walk ourselves into. Um, and that is caused by lifestyle inflation. And it's so easy to let our lifestyles inflate. You get a raise and suddenly you're thinking, oh, well, I can afford the nicer car. And now you've got, yeah, maybe you've got 200 more coming in a month, but you've got now a car payment that costs you 225 more a month. And so many people, as they increase their earnings, they adjust their lifestyle proportionately to the point where there are there are millions of people who are earning more than six figures who are still living paycheck to paycheck because, and you might be one of them, and it is a very stressful situation to be in when you feel like I am earning as much as I can and I'm still just getting by. And the reality is that lifestyle inflation is within our control. Now I'm not talking about if you are living on the baseline of, you know, you're you're not living large, you're not um, you know, you're not driving a fancy car or or paying, you know, for exorbitant rents uh for something that that is um you know just uh uh you know what I mean. The we we can tell the difference of when we're, you know, when we're just spending all the extra um, to beef up our lifestyles versus when you start to earn more, you simultaneously start to save more. And so the goal here is to keep our budgets as we increase our earnings over time and as our experience grows and we get raises and promotions or we learn new skills, as you start to earn more, you want to keep your, yes, you want to enjoy the fruits of your labor, but you need to keep your spending in check so that you can save 10 to 20%. And there, this is where everything up to this point has been economics. Now I'm going to talk about psychology. Okay. So psychology really matters when it comes to how we spend and how much we spend. But I really don't like the way that most budgeting uh, approaches talk about, well, you need to know the difference between a want and a need. Because what that basically teaches is that if you don't need it to survive, then it's not really a need, it's a want. And so anything that isn't required for survival isn't necessarily prioritized. And that leads to very unhappy people and a very unfulfilling life. And this is why I think most people hate budgeting because most budgeting focuses so much on only spending on what you need to survive. And so you're not thriving and you're not happy. And then as soon as you get any extra money, of course you want to go and blow it because you felt deprived and you we don't like to feel deprived. So first of all, I'm going to teach you the simplest budget in the world. Um, and I've already basically touched on this. Basically, as money comes in, some of it will go to debt payments. So all the money that comes into your life goes to one of three places. It either goes to the past to pay off things you've already bought, or it goes to the present to pay off your current lifestyle, to pay for your current lifestyle, or it goes to the future to, uh, to invest in land and capital to create future earnings, future income. Okay, so past, present, and future, those are the only three places your money can go. So the simplest budget in the world to reach financial freedom goes like this. You put 20% toward your future. 30, you limit your past to 30%. So, and you really want to keep that lower if you can, but in order to keep your debt to income ratio healthy, in order to get good interest rates when you do borrow, keeping your debt payments to 30% of your income will ensure that. Um, really targeting 
30% or lower is what that means. Um, and then your present lifestyle, um, you try to keep that to 50% uh, or less of, um, of the money coming in. So this is after you pay your taxes, 20% goes to the future. And then the other 80% split between your past and your present. If that target is achieved, you don't need to line item every bit in your budget. It doesn't matter if you spend it at Target or at, um, at, at you know, wherever. It doesn't matter. If you're hitting that 20% sweet spot of savings, spend the rest, spend the rest however you want. You're, you're going to be okay. But how do we get that 20%? Well, instead of thinking about, is it a want or a need? I really encourage people to think in terms of psychology. And the I like thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs because this is so basic to psychology. Anyone who's taken Psych 101 knows this, that what it really comes down to is that all of these things, survival, safety, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization, which you can't see typed there, these are all needs, they're not wants. We need all of these things in order to feel good as people. So when, you know, there are lots of different ways to get each of these needs met and each different way, each strategy has a different price tag. So like people meet their safety needs. Some people have a home security system. Some people build bunkers. Some people live in gated communities. Some people have a personal security team, uh, financial safety, um, insurance products, cash holding, extreme savings behavior. These are all strategies for meeting our needs for safety. And they all have different price tags associated with them. Um, so uh, we're gonna skip the, uh, worksheets, but um, belonging. Similarly, we can entertain at home. We can go out. We can buy club memberships. We our work or personal identity. These are ways that we meet our needs for belonging. Our clothing style, traveling with family, gifts. We all have these particular strategies that we tend to use to meet our needs, and each of those strategies has a particular price tag associated with it. Esteem needs. Likewise, some people drive luxury cars, they live in a prime neighborhood, they, again, like country club memberships, their work or professional identity, picking up the tab for friends, having the most toys. These are all ways that people meet their esteem needs. Now, what I'm, what I, the point I'm getting at here is not that you can't afford to meet your esteem needs or that you should never drive a luxury car or be part of a country club. I'm saying the exact opposite. We need esteem from others. Human beings, we need it. We need it in the same way that we need to feel safe. It's self-actualization and esteem. These are needs. They're not wants. So you don't need to know the difference between a want and a need. What you have to understand is the difference between a need and a strategy for meeting that need. And it's the strategies that we choose that often get to be too expensive. And so when you think about budgeting, how can you live within that 80% of your take-home pay? The real challenge comes down to how can I create a lifestyle for myself where all of my needs from survival to self-actualization are getting met so I don't feel deprived, so I don't feel like I'm, I'm missing out on living the good life. I feel like I am living the good life, but the strategies that I'm choosing to meet these psychological needs all add up to 80% of my take-home pay. And then budgeting, rather than an exercise that feels like a diet, it's a creative problem-solving exercise where you go, how can I thrive and feel totally fulfilled on 80% of my take-home pay? How can I change my strategies um, so that I'm meeting all my needs? And, you know, I'll just give you uh, one concrete example from my own life. So I, well, two, but they're similar. So I love um, clothes and I love driving beautiful cars. Um, I have a convertible. I've had a convertible since college. I will never not drive a convertible if I have anything to say about it. 
Uh, I drive this gorgeous Audi A5 that I found with only 30,000 miles on it. It is, um, it is 15 years old, but it was taken impeccable care of. And, um, and I found it, I paid in cash for this car, less money than more pe than most people pay, uh, for, you know, like a, a used compact vehicle. Like I found the treasure, um, that was affordable because I know that I'm meeting emotional needs by driving my car. And so I don't want to go into debt to meet my emotional needs, but I do want to meet my emotional needs. I love driving this car. Um, and so having the car of my dreams helps me feel like I'm living the life I want to be living, but I spent relatively very little on this car because I wasn't willing to go into debt to meet my emotional needs. I met them, but I found a strategy by being willing to drive an older car that just happens to be in great shape and still beautiful. Um, I do the same thing with clothes. I go to consignment shops and I and and other secondhand stores and I shop clearance racks and I love the self-expression. The, the It meets my needs for esteem and self-actualization to have a wardrobe that I love, but I keep the price tag in check um, and I found strategies for meeting those needs within the confines of my budget. And so I've been able to save. And as I earn more, I save more because I'm totally fulfilled emotionally and psychologically within the, the confines of the, um, the cost of living that I'm targeting. And so it budgeting can actually be fun when you approach it in this way of I want to live a life that I absolutely love, but the challenge is I'm going to do it on 80% or less of my take home pay. And now instead of just cutting things out of my life because I can't afford them, I'm finding creative ways to meet my needs for less money. So that's the kind of budgeting that will help you long-term stick to 80% of or less of your take-home pay because you won't be feeling deprived and this need to splurge every time your income increases or you get a bonus. You'll actually be feeling like, great, more to save. I can sock that away and meet my long-term needs. So that is the big idea. Um, I'm going to skip over this other stuff, um, but the the goal that we want here is you want to find a way that all, all of your categories of needs are satisfied within that 80% of your take-home pay. And the two ways that you do that are one, by, by avoiding lifestyle inflation. And if, if, you're, if you're not able to meet your needs within 80% of your budget, then you've got to find a way to earn more. And if you um, if you feel like there are ways that you could be saving by being creative about getting your needs met, then the combination of both of those things together is how you're able to sustainably over time save 20% of your take-home pay. And with that, we have six minutes for questions. Thank you, Sarah. That was amazing. That's the part that I could hear you listen to you talk about all day long. That's the special sauce, I think, of this whole conversation. And I think for those of us, because I know there's some folks that have joined as employers or educators who are working with young people and young adults, I think this whole idea, my favorite thing is the throw out the wants versus needs, they're all needs. We, we need them all for something. And so helping young adults to identify what need is that thing that purchase fulfilling like yeah. getting in touch with that first of all I bought this thing I you know paid for this experience or whatever what need is it fulfilling yeah. no and is shame. it really fulfilling no it you know is it really yeah. is it really serving that purpose that you're intending and so I think that is really where it's at in terms of the budgeting and the you know, I've, I've really tried to get away from wants versus needs because I think emphasizing they're all needs. Yeah. Just make yeah, sure every, it's everything is like you don't need the thing. The thing is a strategy for meeting a deeper need. So once you can reflect on what is the deeper need, then we start to realize, well, our strategy, there's there's a million ways 
to meet that deeper need. And it's about being creative and knowing yourself and find and trying things. You'll, you'll try things and realize, nope, that doesn't quite hit the mark. So you try something else. And once you get to those strategies that really do meet the need, you'll find the cravings to spend subside. Yeah. So real quickly before, and if you want to stop sharing so that I can share real quick um, in the last few minutes. So we've recorded this. We will make the entire deck available, Sarah. Is that possible to share the deck as a PDF with everyone? And then if there's any resources around this hierarchy of needs, links that you can direct us to, we'll include those too. But I think that's really powerful. I think that's the piece that if we can get people to unravel that, and better understand what need is it fulfilling Mm -hmm. and how can you divert that into something that's more affordable or within your, I I think that's really where it's at. So we'll, we'll see. I I was looking to see if I have a copy of loaded. So I have a book that I put out in 2016 called loaded and it has a whole chapter on this wants versus needs. Um, It really dives deep into how to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. And then any questions that we didn't address, and I think there's one in the Q&A right now, um, I'll be sure to include those in the follow-up. So I'll give Sarah a chance for those of you who asked questions um, that we didn't address, I'll be sure to, you know, include those if we can. Uh, So real quickly... Welcome back, Mary, by the way, yeah. Sorry, I, I yeah. accidentally pressed the, I was reading the questions to see if you had seen them and I accidentally said it would be answered live. So, oh, uh, sure. Go ahead. That person, no, to that person uh, asking uh, the anonymous attendee, Mary just said there will be follow up. Uh, yeah. So I, I accidentally yeah. pressed that. Well, and what we can do, I'll leave this out there as an option. Once I show you just a couple quick things on the fame side, we can stay on for a few minutes and just address a couple last minute questions. Folks who have to leave can leave. We're recording. You'll have access to the recording. So that's perfectly fine with me as well. Sarah, if you've got a couple minutes, Mm -hmm. um, that would be great. So I wanted to just really quickly, I'm not going to do an entire um, tour of Enrich. Uh, or anything like that, but I want to, let me just um, see where I'm at here. Okay. So I want to real quick, just call out that we have a digital financial wellness platform that is available to any main, main, anybody in Maine and of any age Um, it's called enrich. So it's a financial education tool that we've purchased for the entire state of Maine. It's available at fame.enrich.org. And so I'm on my dashboard right now. Hopefully you're seeing the fame um, uh, site right now. I'm I'm attempted to share it. Just a thumbs up, Sarah, if you see what I'm... Okay, cool. Um, So basically this resource provides you one of the things that's really cool about it is when you sign up for enrich it's going to take you through a series of questions um really trying to get a handle on your life stage what are some of your financial goals what are the stresses you know kind of the things that keep you up at night and then the the platform is customized based on how you answer those initial questions. And so you'll be served up content and recommendations based on your circumstances. There's another version of this tool for high school and college students called iGrad. And so you can access that at fame.igrad.com. Enrich is the adult um, version of the tool. So it has a ton of wonderful resources. One of the things that I want to just call out, if you hover over topics, you'll find the courses. So there are 20 plus courses on a variety of different financial topics, and they you know, take as little as 15 to 45 minutes to complete the course. Um, so you can check those out. There are a ton of tools available. And the one I want to highlight is the Money Personality Tool. This is my favorite tool on the site because it takes you through a series of questions to help you understand your money mindset. What are your emotions? 
What are your influences? What are the things that are driving your financial behaviors? Because as we know, and as Sarah has said over and over, it's not all about the knowledge. We kind of know the things we're supposed to do, but our emotions and our psychology kind of drive that. So I just wanted to call that out and make you aware of that. And then the other real quick, I want to show you if you go to the FAME website, just want to make sure I'm in the right place before I take you there. Um, if you just go right to famemain.com, when you first enter the Fame website, you're going to see there's an entire financial wellness section. So you can check that out. And we've got information organized around build, grow, or invest. Build is information for you as an individual. Grow is if you're working with students or you're a parent or caregiver and you want to take a look at resources that we have available for young people. And then invest is for those of you who are employers and you want to build financial wellness in the workplace. So just wanted to show you that real quickly. And then also let you know that our next uh, financial check-in and I'm going to go to the site now because I want to make sure I get this right. Um, our next check-in is on May 3rd at noon, and it's going to be Saving for Education, Separating Facts versus Myth. And this is all around saving for college um, and things that we want you to know about that. So we hope that you will join us. All right. So those are the things I wanted to just real quickly um, touch on. Uh, question here. Yes, we're going to share the slides so we've got that one covered. Um, one of the questions, Sarah, um, oh, you already answered it. So I don't know if you want to share it with the group. Um, well, yeah. So the, there was a question about like, okay, I'm in my 40s. I'm still living paycheck to paycheck. Do you have any advice for people starting when they're older? So what I shared was that I didn't even start saving until I was 38. And, and I was a single mom at that point, living in Washington, D.C., one of the most expensive metro areas around. And so the only thing I could do at that point for savings was my 401k. And so I, I got the employer match and I saved in my 401k. And, you, you know, it like I said, it's like a muscle that you start to develop and you you start to get a taste for it. And it feels better and better as you start to enjoy watching those numbers go up. Uh, so I would just say, you know, whatever you can save, even again, even if it's $10 a paycheck, save it and then make sure you're every time you make a deposit, watch that number go up, get get that good feeling of watching that number go up, even if it's just a little bit. And over time, uh, when you earn more, save more. Uh, when you, you know, when we know better, we do better. Just, just when you, when you have any extra, kick it over into your savings. And um, a lot of the time we, we will spend money because it's in our checking account. And so we, we feel like it's, it's safe to spend. So, you know, making automatic, even if they're small automatic deposits to your savings account, just regular ones. Um, it's a lifesaver. Just save as much as you can, as often as you can and check in to learn how you know to start loving the feeling of the numbers going up and and it does compound it does get faster and more exciting and more fun to save over time that's great sarah thank you we had a question about um earlier on about money market recommendations what i responded and certainly feel free to weigh in sarah but you know starting with your financial institution your trusted um, you know, bank or credit union that you're working with, we'll do some digging and see if we can provide up some follow some follow up resources in terms of evaluating. We can't make direct recommendations about specific funds, but there might be some tools through Enrich or otherwise that we can recommend for how to evaluate. Where do you begin if you want to approach that? Anything else to add to that at it's all? Just that when it when it comes to things like money markets, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, index funds. A lot of them, like there are thousands of them, but they're a lot of them are very much the same as any other. And so as long as they're coming from a reputable, trusted resource like your bank or, you know, a really a good like Vanguard tends to be very, you know, solid and well loved for their funds like you, you don't need to uh, worry too much about, well, which one specifically, you know, if it's FDIC insured, then uh, if, if the institution is FDIC insured, that's great. Most investments themselves won't be FDIC insured. But, um, you know, point being that you don't have to, to 
to agonize over which particular one. A lot of them are very much the same as, as their neighbor. Great. And then the last question, and I added, you know, in the Q&A, and you addressed it as well. I think that with the emergency savings, um, people get really stuck even in the three to six months and forget about it if you said a year. So yeah. for people who have zero saved yeah. in emergency savings, you know, setting a really small savings goal, whether yeah. it's I mean, start with or like, thousand, I'm going exactly. to, if you've got zero, like maybe your goal is that six months from now, I will have $500 in that account. Like it, the, the point is start somewhere. Um, the other thing I would say about emergency funds is that I think that a lot of people, um, they start an emergency fund and then it gets drained because something happens. And then you feel like, well, what's the point? Um, and I think one of the things, and there's some research to back this up, um, is that we are actually really bad at, we're good at, at predicting our regular expenses, but we're really bad at predicting those, those very common, but irregular things like getting a haircut or buying a present for, um, for someone for their birthday or things like that. And generally when you make your budget, you want to take your budget and then add like 20% for a miscellaneous category. And this is the, your buffer, your known unknowns. Because if, if you just, if you don't have a buffer in your monthly expenses, then you're always going to have to go to your savings account. And you're always, you'll never be able to build the savings over time. So you need to be planning in your, in your monthly budget for this buffer um, amount. And then on top of that, you kick the extra over into savings. And then if you don't use the buffer for a month, put them in the savings. But the point being that I think a lot of people are underestimating what their actual monthly costs are. And so they think they're saving when really that money can't be saved because it's going to need to be used in the next 30 days, 60 days. Yeah. So we your monthly expenses are your regular monthly expenses are probably more than you think they are. So build that in and then plan for your savings on top of it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. This has been great. We could stay with you all day and learn more and more and more. Perhaps we'll have you it. back on another part of our series next year. Um, but we appreciate it so much. And congratulations on your award. And mm -hmm. just thank you so much for being here with us today. We really, really enjoyed it. And I look forward Thanks to seeing everyone you in for person joining. in a couple of weeks. Right.